Today we have with us the director and some of the researchers behind the documentary The Six, um, which just premiered in the U.S. about two weeks ago at the Immigration Film Fest online. The documentary explores what happened to the six Chinese survivors of the Titanic, who knew there were six, and what happened to them after. Here at My China Roots, we are all about digging into the mysteries that are within us, within our family histories, and I know that the journey for uncovering what happened to these six men um, has been quite, quite a long, long road of a lot of twists and turns. Um, so we're super excited to dive in behind the scenes. Specifically, we have with us Arthur Jones, who is a British filmmaker, uh, joining us from Shanghai today. So it's very late at night for him. Um, and thank you for <laughs> accommodating us, Arthur, with the time. And he's... No he's, worries. Yeah, well known for films like Poseidon Project, um, A Farewell Song. So I definitely, yeah, just recommend checking out more of his work after this. Um, Stephen, uh, he's the lead researcher, historian, leading the investigation in The Six. He's joining us from New Jersey, an award-winning maritime historian, writer, journalist. Um, you've been in China for, what, over 25 years now at this point? This 25 morning. years, yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Quarter century. Yeah, so so glad to have you here with us. Um, and we have Grant Din, uh, who is joining us here from Oakland, where I am, California. A uh, genealogist um, has been super, super involved in curating a lot of the research and exhibits at the Angel Island Immigration Station here in the Happy Bay Area. Happy to be here. Yeah, Thanks welcome, so Grant. Um, Thank you. And last but not least, we have Chloe joining us from London. Um, Chloe is a researcher, uh, the head of designing our records database here at My China Roots. Super cool researcher. <laughs> uh, so thank you all for joining us from four different time zones. Um, feel free to pop in the chat where you're joining us from here today. And of course, what questions you may have for our panel. All right, I'm gonna dive in now. And I'd love to start with Steven slash Arthur, whoever wants to take this ball. How did all this start? <laughs> uh, I know that this was filmed over what, over six years, over 20 cities around the world. Um, what was the seed of this process and how did the questions you ask evolve over time? We started out by, um, Arthur and I had done a previous documentary and book project together. The documentary was called The Poseidon Project. My book was called just Poseidon with a very long subtitle. And, um, you know, Arthur and I have been friends for more than 20 years at this point, I, meaning now, not not when we started this, but, but you know, so we were friends at the time, and that's how we got working on Poseidon in the first place. And, you know, we really enjoyed the process, and we were we were pretty happy with the, the outcome, both the, you know, the finished documentary and the book. And we decided, well, that was fun. You know, let's, let's, let's do another one. You know, what, what's, what's next? And um, so we actually started working on um, an, another project. We actually started working on a, a shipwreck story um, that was based in Shanghai. We got a, a ways down the track with it. We interviewed some survivors and so forth. Then we started thinking, well, how are we going to tell this story? You know, this is a certainly to an international audience and probably even to a Chinese audience. You know, this is an unknown story. And how are we going to tell it in a way that doesn't require us to kind of you know, go through years of Chinese history to, to, to explain the background. And uh, I thought, well, that's easy. We'll just compare it to Titanic. We'll just compare, you know, the size of the ship and number of passengers and circumstances and so forth. So as, as any uh, decent amateur maritime historian would, uh, I went back to my Titanic shelf and I started reading, you know, just rereading Titanic material, including now that, you know, there are some excellent resources online and I guess it was in one of those, um, I, I believe it's called Encyclopedia Titanica, it, you know, it was on one of these websites. And I, and I ran across, I know that I had seen before that there were Chinese passengers on board Titanic. And probably like everyone else that looked at that page, I looked at it, saw that there wasn't information, said, oh, that's interesting and moved on. But this time when I encountered it, it just, it just grabbed my attention. I just thought, well, but why don't we know anything more about these men? The hundredth anniversary of Titanic sinking had passed in in 2012. No one had raised their hand and said, "Oh, my grandfather was on Titanic." Or, and, and and I thought that that's ridiculous. That's how is that possible? Did these did these men sail away from New York and just 
you know, go down in, in another shipwreck? I mean, how, why don't we have these stories? And so really it just started from there and um, took us a little while to change course from that original story. You know, when you, when you started on something, you don't want to just suddenly, you know, change focus. But, but I think we realized fairly quickly that, that this was, you know, the story that we were working on was silver, but this was gold and, and, and we had to do it um, in a more urgent way. Yeah. And I'd love to hear if you could speak a bit more to what for you do you feel was slash is the urgency of the story, right? Like, why is it so important that someone take all this time and put in resources to shed light to bring this to the surface? Who is this story for? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, the, for me, the urgency was just that I think I'll, I'll let Arthur speak for himself, but I was afraid that somebody else would stumble on this and and start working on it. And I thought, you know, that it was entirely possible that, that, you know, someone was already working on it and we weren't aware of them. Truth be told, there is, you know, there had already been a full length book written by um, Professor Chung Wei in, in Beijing, who is, uh, he's, you know, he appears in the film. He had already written a book about the six men, but much more in a sort of sociological context. And, um, you know, we found some other stuff where, where reporters in China had kind of worked on it a little bit and, and, you know, did quite well with it, given their resources, given that they were doing it remotely. But, you know, I, I, I just didn't want somebody else to end up with the story. Um, but in terms of urgency, it was luckily at the time we were not experiencing the wave of anti-Asian violence that we are at the moment. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there were certainly incidents of it going on, but it didn't seem to be, you know, it didn't seem to have the momentum that it had now. So it just seemed like, why isn't anybody doing this story? This is, you know, we know so much about Titanic and its history and the history of its passengers, and we don't know anything about these guys. So why shouldn't we do this story? I couldn't agree more. Um, Arthur, did you want to add anything to that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, Obviously, for me, the concern is, you know, how do we turn these sort of ideas? The challenge from the beginning was, you know, is there is there a film in this? Is that, you know, because it's clearly interesting. Um, but, you know, when you want to create a film, there are certain elements you're looking for. So alongside, you know, just being able to find great new records, things that hadn't been found. I was fairly confident if there was anything available that Stephen and the whoever else we, we brought on as researchers would be able to find it, you know, just based on experience on Poseidon. It's rare that a piece of history has been so, you know, co um, uh, you know, plowed over that, that there's nothing left to turn up. Um, but, you know, that, that was that was one of the things. Was there going to be anything new we could find? But secondly, for me, it was, you know, where's going to be the sort of emotional heart of this film? Uh, you know, films are a great way of delivering emotion and a less good way of delivering sort of raw informational data. So how are we going to turn a really data heavy story into a, into a film, an audience would watch and hopefully feel moved by that they would, you know, they, they would get goosebumps. They would, they would um, maybe cry, you know, at some scenes. And that's what we're looking for, something that will work on the big screen. And I think that the heart of that was for me, the idea of, we know everyone who's, who clearly everyone who died on Titanic is gone, but even all the survivors had gone by, sort of 2009, 2010, somewhere around there. So who was, who were we going to film? Who are we going to find? And the obvious place to start was, uh, was descendants. So, you know, once we had found clear descendants, I was relieved and I felt, well, we got a film here. But the second part of that was, I was really determined to make this film a celebration of, 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 of research in all its forms, you know, whether that's sort of detective work or whether it's genealogy or whether it's, it's, uh, you know, very personal family tree research, whether it's pure history. Um, and I just want it to be a celebration of those people because, you know, I've been in rooms before. Stephen and I did Poseidon together and I have a little bit of a history background. But, uh, you know, and I know what it feels like when you find something that's just amazing and no one has uh, and no one has seen it before. Um, you know, from the outside, visually, it's a person in a room in a library or something. But, you know, it feels very dramatic when you, I'm sure everyone, hopefully everyone here today listening, has had that experience of finding a little nugget of information. And I thought that has to be something we can turn into a film. So that was the challenge for me alongside the sort of research challenges of how did these guys survive Titanic? And then, and then why did they disappear in a way that was unique to the Titanic survivor story? Yeah. 
We had a question in the audience. I was wondering, you know, did the descendants, was that something you intentionally sought out from the beginning, right, for the sake of, sto- of narrative, or it happened organically? And um, what I'm hearing is that from the beginning, you were kind of like descendants. That's where we need to start. Well, I felt like, uh, you know, there might be a, you know, it's not for me to judge whether there's a book in it, but I thought, well, maybe there's a book because in a book you can, you can explain a lot of that stuff. You can sort of animate someone who's no longer alive. You can give them character and so on. Uh, but, you know, we're playing with visuals and, and sound and so on. So it was harder to tell that story of our survivors uh, when they would always just be old photographs. And so we had to find a way to do that. And so, yeah, for me, one of the bottom lines that something Steve and I talked about earlier on in Lawton, our producer, when she, when she and the uh, the LP Films uh, team joined the project uh, about midway, two, two three years in, uh, for me, it was always about, you know, we had to have people to film, whether they were survivors, descendants, or whether they were the researchers themselves, through whom we could see, you know, what it feels like in their expression, in their face, in, in the excitement, mm-hmm. in their voice, even if it's over a sort of Skype call or something, you know, we wanted to be able to hear close excitement and grand excitement, grand excitement, you know, when they, when they find something and then they tell us about it, you know, I just think that's, that's not, uh, you know, gunshots and car chases but in our world i think it's it's just as exciting absolutely got to count every breakthrough (laughs) as a win yeah you (laughs) i want to go back to what you're saying about this this film as a celebration of research right the research questions mindset process um i'd like to dig a little bit deeper into that and hear from steven on this uh, and then i want to turn it to chloe and grant as well to weigh in on the specific uh questions that that you two were digging into um and my question is what shines through this film for me and, and a lot of people is your commitment to telling a full story and looking at it from all these different angles and not leaving any stones unturned and you had these kind of creative ways of doing these quote-unquote tests right like you know Stephen, you like sat into the water the, the frigid freezing water um the boat had all the kids sit in the boat to test its size right um is it feasible that these theories could have you know been actually plausible um so i'm curious like how how did you come up with Try and figure out, like, what are these standards? What are these criteria for telling a fuller, comprehensive story? Sure. So, when we started out doing this, you know, Arthur and I agreed on very early that what we were most interested in was was getting the facts. Okay, just what what did the evidence tell us? Um, and and. Titanic is kind of like biblical archaeology. You really need to kind of put on your, um, you know, since we're not able to interview survivors, and in some cases, we're not even able to interview their children, um, you know, the idea of getting first person accounts of anything, you know, you're really limited to what's been recorded over time, whether it was testimony at one of the inquiries, or, um, excuse me, an interview that someone gave later or some of the uh, newspaper accounts of the time, um, you know, where someone wrote a memoir, they wrote a letter or something like that. Um, But, you know, one thing that had not been done in a case like this was that, uh, you know, no one had had applied science to uh, try to to resolve historical questions. Um, We were accused very early on of someone said to us, Hey, you know, you guys are in China and you're working on this story and don't try to sugarcoat this, uh, you know, for a Chinese audience. Um, and that was never our intent. Uh, we really wanted to, we didn't have the answers to those questions when we started out. And we just wanted to know what the, you know, what, what, what did the evidence really say? And it, the evidence, not just, you know, people saying, oh, I saw the Chinese men, oh, I didn't see the Chinese men, whatever. But, you know, what was possible? What was possible in a lifeboat of that size? Could you really hide? Could you conceal yourself for four hours, you know, in the bottom of a freezing cold boat uh, and then emerge later on? Could you, how long could you have, you know, um, lived or been functional in, you know, icy water when you're trying to find debris or you're trying to, you know, keep yourself afloat and you know that that was our interest and 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 that drove all of the questions and it drove the way that the research went how did we you know how are we going to answer these questions uh and then also the you know the list of names that we had and looking at that list and saying oh my god like 
you know, what, what, what are these names? Where did these names come from? And, and, you know, um, what dialect is this? So forth. So, you know, we started out with those very broad questions and we made a fundamental mistake early on, which was thinking that we would be able to do the research largely ourselves. And then at one point, you know, I mean, having the name, you know, you know, having Titanic as this at the center of your, your project. I mean, that's, you know, should be a hint that it's going to be really big. Um, but we, we managed to not notice that early on. And then it, after that, it was realizing that we needed specific, you know, research assistance, not just research, but genealogical assistance and genealogical assistance in places where uh, we thought that our survivors went, whether it was Canada or the UK or, or the United States or even elsewhere in China. And and that was really where we we started to contact with um, my China roots and with Grant and you know with the uh, the amazing group of researchers that we end up working with. And right before we turn over to Chloe and Grant for their perspective, we have someone in the audience who wants to know specifically how did that boat test project with the students come about? Was it like a class of students? What was the actual capacity of the collapsible boat? You <laughs> so I mean it was. I'll say this in the nicest possible way. Uh, there is a sort of um, an unofficial standing committee of people who are considered the leading experts on Titanic. And they were a Greek chorus of voices that were always in the back of my head uh, throughout the research because they were very quick to poo-poo anything new that, that they themselves did not discover. And I thought, you know, the easiest thing for us to do would be to build a bathtub, bathtub size model of a collapsible lifeboat and stick a bunch of Ken and Barbies in there to kind of, you know, uh, to, to, you know, to, to see if we could, you know, simulate what, what, what had happened in the lifeboat and, and how many people it held and could you hide. And I thought there's no way that, that anybody is ever going to believe this. There's no way we're ever going to be able to prove it once and for all unless we build a full lifeboat and fill it with real people, you know, real life-sized people. Um, and, you know, I, I thought from the beginning, well, gee, I don't know anything about building a boat. Um, but, you know, if we, if we did this in cooperation with an international school, for example, <laughs> This would be a great after-school activity. They would get a lot of benefit out of it. Um, they would be able to provide the labor, um, you know, which was obviously a key factor. But that it would sort of be a win-win for for everyone involved, and it, and it absolutely was. I mean, I, I I hope the students feel that way. I hope Mark Trumpel, the the teacher who oversaw it, uh, I know he feels that way. But I mean, you know, just to to bring that to life, I don't think anybody had recreated a a a, an Engelhart possible lifeboat in decades. Um, and uh, I mean, it was the only way to solve the only, sometimes the only way to solve it is to do it. You know, you've got to build a boat and put people in it. You've got to put yourself in cold water and see what it feels like. You know, it's, it's just basic science, but you've, you've got to go and do it. You can't, you know, you can't just build a CAD model or, or, you know, build a scale model and, and, and try to get the, a realistic experience. Yeah, and that's what I loved about the process because because I think sometimes there's a perception that research can just be you know very cerebral, very like in our ivory towers kind of. But your process was very embodied, right? You got in the water, right? You tested out, felt it for yourself, just as a human being. Um, so yes, kudos, kudos for taking that step. Um, Chloe and Grant, um, I would love to hear your perspective as researchers, as storytellers, even just as human beings. Like, um, what was your experience? Um, yeah, what was important to you to explore or kind of hold true to in your process? Um, you can kind of tell us as well, you know, what, what, what you were <laughs> um, digging into specifically. Let's start with Chloe and then we'll, we'll move to Grant. Yeah, sure. So much to talk about. <laughs> so... Uh, for context, I when when Arthur and Stephen got in touch with us, they uh, needed help specifically with tracking down what happened to the survivors who were believed to have continued working as crew members on these boats, especially in the UK. So I spent a lot of time 
looking at crew lists of British ships at the National Archives in London. I mean, your question earlier on was how how do you tell true story i want to say like as researchers at the end of the day we we tell part of the story but there are so many possible stories that we investigate throughout the whole process i mean there are so many sub stories that we looked into that we believed in for a while and then had to drop because the trail went cold and of course you can't put all of these in the film but i do think that it's quite clear in the documentary um that leads do go cold and when you are a researcher, of course, you are hoping for those discoveries, hoping for those nuggets. And it can be quite frustrating when they don't come. Uh, and that was something that I faced, especially looking at these crew lists for hours and hours, because our survivors had such common names. Um, I guess what transpired from it was how invisible and anonymous so many of them were at the time. And the mere fact that I did not find a single first-hand account of what it was like to be working in the engine rooms on these merchant ships that they would have worked on from the perspective of a, a Chinese or a foreign seaman really tells you how invisible they were to broader society. Yeah, um, and I, I know that there was this question that you're pursuing of why did they disappear and, you know, how how form, firmly can we say that there were efforts, that the UK did have take these like post-World War II efforts to like forcibly or not repatriate the Chinese sailors? Like, um, I guess for you as someone who's, you know, growing up in the UK, like how, even just like emotionally, like how has it been for you just trying to like reconcile with with that and yes. who to hold accountable mm. or not, right? Oh. Um, <laughs> it's it's been really tough the whole experience was very eye-opening for me and it's sort of um uh, correlated with in the uk especially in the past few years there has been an increased awareness around the topic of the chinese labor corps and chinese contribution to our history to the to, to both world wars and of course you had the um the confirmed forced repatriation of a uh, chinese merchant seamen after world war ii um that has made the news has been in the news for a few years but um yeah, and, and in the past, working with My China Roots, we only have had a very small minority of British Chinese people and families that we work with. So I, I, I felt a lot during this whole process. I wanted so badly to uncover some sort of truth in the process, but it has been very difficult, especially... I, I, I just remember clearly sitting at the archives and going through this huge pile of documents where it was letter after letter from the Home Office and and the, the the heads of police of Liverpool and London discussing what to do with these people. And I knew that I was not the first to look at these documents, but I was almost shocked that they were all in this really messy bundle. Just the lack of respect for the history has was really shocking to me. So I'm just so glad that this film is out and that we can start and continue to talk about it. Um, in terms of whether they did repatriate them or not, we were just discussing this with Arthur the other day. I mean, it's, 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 it, we, we probably will never know. Uh, one thing I also discovered through this process is that archives cull a lot of their documents. It's a very common process. They probably destroyed a lot of their own documents. Even just tracking down the crew lists from the ships that these men were working on was no easy feat because the National Archives back in the 60s decided they just wanted to get rid of 90% of the shipping records that they had for British ships from the late 1800s to the mid-1950s. And it's only because a, uh, a, a maritime history archive over in Canada didn't want that to happen, that a lot of these crew lists were saved. Um, we assume that a lot has been recorded, even though, yeah, in most cases, it's not the case. Oh, that hurts. Hey, I, I, was, <laughs> I was just going to add to the end of that, I mean, I, just to say that, you know, this is something that the team and, and Chloe and I, we, you know, we sort of struggled with this issue of how to describe something like that, you know, when, as close as it's, it's very clear what happened after the Second World War, after the First World War, 
Quell uncovered the, this material that has really not been talked about before. And, uh, you know, some of it pointed towards the idea there was a sort of uh, collusion between the shipping companies and the government, maybe the unions. There's a point at which I think their plan was to sort of charter ships or or perhaps have merchant ships that were, you know, going in the right direction, then to get a ton of Chinese guys on board and sort of ship them out and then not have them come back. So almost sort of controlling their their status, their residential status, if you like, via contract law rather than immigration law, in a sense, or labor law. Um, whether or not it actually happened is difficult to say. Um, and, you know, and we want to be make sure in a film like this that we're not, especially when it's a film about research, that we're not just sort of telling an untruth about it. But it's very difficult to make that call because as close as you don't know what's been deliberately uh, culled to keep it unclear, to not be able to reach conclusions. What we do know is that in one particular, I think from an autumn through to a winter, in the space of two or three months, something like that, Chloe will correct me if I'm wrong here, but over the space of a very, very short time, essentially British Chinatowns cleared out of the, the majority, maybe even the vast majority of, of Chinese sailors uh, in, in, I think, late 19, 19, 19, 20. So given that they'd been there for 15, 20 years or so, uh, for them all to clear out so suddenly, clearly there's something going on. We do know that some of them were offered money to leave, as in leave quietly and we'll pay you off. We'll pay off the, the, the rental fees you owe. We also know that they were really lacking in work opportunities. You know, there's so many British sailors had arrived back after the war and there was a general economic decline around the world. It was one of those periods when immigrants are always treated badly. You can almost predict it. Um, so it's very difficult to 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 make a call on that. Um, but you also don't want to pull your punches in a film. So I think one mm -hmm. of the challenges for me was, um, you know, how to describe uncertainty. I think that was one of my challenges from the beginning, and one of the team's challenge. And the edit certainly came through. You know, how do you describe a situation of uncertainty? Um, how do you manifest that on screen? And one of the ways we did that was to sort of use little trick you know certainly though you know, even down to simple things like how we colored the film how we graded the film how we shot the interviews and all that kind of stuff you know we're often playing around with dark and light and then and then some of the scenes where we show what happened to the the actual Chinese survivors we decided to animate them with a sort of very almost impressionistic uh, animation style uh, just because I felt you know if you reconstruct it you have to cast people and you can see their faces and they look a certain way well we don't know what they look like until until we found photographs of some of them. So we wanted to be able to deal with those issues of uncertainty. And also that, again, I come back to the idea of filming people, filming researchers and their faces, seeing uncertainty in people's eyes and all the rest of it. So we're very much dealing with those not black and white areas. You know, history often gets presented in this very black and white way. But I think that actually genealogists, historians, scientists in other areas too, to be honest, a lot of the work they do is a leap of imagination. You know, it's it's you're actually using your storytelling senses to try and make to try and make sense of a series of data points that don't have many things connecting them. And so I, I'm I'm fascinated by that idea of, you know, even in the most and we're making a film, that's something that people would often think, oh, that's a very creative thing to do. But actually, we're all engaged in acts of creativity and imagination and, and leaps of faith where you have to assume that someone called Chang Chip. Uh, who's traveled thousands of miles might be the same chum chick because it's the same name and it's unusual. It's the same age and he's got the same illness, but you don't know for sure. So you just have to kind of follow your gut on that. And then hopefully at some point later on, another fact will turn up and that will confirm an assumption you made earlier. But these are just leaps of faith. And I was fascinated by that idea as something to explore. Mm. Yeah, I I remember when the the poster for the film first came out, I got chills just seeing how you had visualized it as, you know, these black bars kind of like covering the eyes of some of these men or like cutouts of their silhouettes in, in the, like as the newspaper background. So just creating that, that sense of mystery. Um, good, good job. Um, I want to loop in Grant at this point uh, to just kind of share a bit, like how, how did you navigate uncertainty? <laughs> yeah, and you're part of the investigation. Oh, sure. Happy to talk about it. one of the great things of working on this project was a collaboration. Usually as a gene as genealogists, we're working on our own projects and, you know, kind of digging. But one thing that was great on this and that I think your um, the discord uh, 
helps is that people can post questions. And so we were uh, on WeChat and saying, oh, I found this, I found that, and what do you think of this? And so um, it was really great to work with the, the other the researchers. So early on, um, when I've learned about different aspects, well, we, we had some shared files. And uh, the, you know the key things that you saw in the film is that uh, Fang Long was on um, Titanic and then on, on the Carpathia. But if you look real closely, um, his ages were different. And I think his heights were listed differently. And I said, okay, well, I was a little skeptical at first. I said, well, I wonder if it's, you know, just lost in translation. The, the, and maybe that's why his name is so different all, all over the place. And, and so I said, okay, well, we got to find a way to, to show he's the same person as following son. And we had uh, the petition for naturalization, which for all researchers out there if you can find that it's it's very useful because it has a, a number at the bottom it's an a file number in the united states and uh, that number can lead to a full file and i was hoping to get that so um, um one thing was i i posted to the united states citizenship and immigration services and i said um, i'd like to get this file and um they in their bureaucratic ways said, oh, no, you need to go to this other office. And I said, no, the number is a certain number, so it should go to this office, the Freedom of Information Act office. So when it went to the other office, which was the genealogy office, a next of kin had to apply for that. So I said, uh, sent word to Tom, uh, Tom Fong that, oh, you have to apply for this. And then, uh, so he did. And then he got a note saying, you need to go to the FOIA, Freedom of Information Act office, which is where I had started. So I was getting very frustrated and the, the, um, Arthur and Stephen wanted information you know, soon, of course. And so I, I had been to a webinar like a couple years before by the head of USCIS uh, history. And I said, in desperation, you know, I really need your help because um, you know, I'm not getting anywhere. And they said, okay, well, here's what you do. And then, so I had been number 32,000 in the queue for information. And the, the, the way they, what they told me to do moved me up to 3,200 or so. And uh, so I was looking for the file because that could lead to things like uh, Fong Wing Sun's immigration situation, you know, how he came in, when he came in. Did, did he seem like he could have been on Titanic? And so uh, I had to wait for quite a while and uh, maybe a month or two passed and eventually it came in. And I looked at it, and it was um, a little discouraging at first. It had every single place he had lived and worked in Milwaukee and Chicago since 1912, from 1912 to about 1940s, and then every place he had worked in great detail. But of course, on his um, petition, he had said he arrived in New York in September of 1920 on a ship unknown. So he had all the details for everything else in his life, but on an unknown ship. So it seemed like he was trying to, you know, hide something that he must have known that. And then I uh, finally dug in the file and looked again, and it said previous occupation. I mean, he had been a laundryman. He had been a, a waiter in a restaurant. Previous occupation, seaman. Previous residence, Le Havre, France. And I said, this is not an ordinary Chinese immigrant. <laughs> not that anyone's ordinary. But it's like, oh, my God, this is this is Fang Long. He, he was a seaman. And I, you know, jumped on WeChat and told everyone. And, and it was it was like uh, really exciting to figure that he must have eventually we figured he must have just jumped ship in New York, headed all the way to the Midwest. And then that article uh, that you saw in the film where he was going to stand up for one of the other Titanic men's wedding made sense. It said, well, there's this whole network of Chinese in the Midwest in the early 19 teens that was uh, active. And it's like, you know, <laughs> for a while I was, I was looking at Chinese rooming houses in Cleveland and things like that. And, and it was just uh, amazing to, to find this information and um, to tell Tom, I said, Tom, look, this document says your father was a seaman. And it's like, that kind of confirmed a lot of what we had been looking for. And, um, you know, it's just such a challenge, but so amazing. I mean, Ling He, we had, we had two Ling He's in our files and one of them was buried in San Francisco. I said, oh, this is great. Who knows, there might be some, some way we can connect him to the West Coast. But it turned out he was not the right Ling He. So, you know, that's kind of an example of the, 
of the challenges. And um, one thing that Fong Wing Sun, it, he came to the U.S. at least as early as 1912 on the Titanic. But you notice that how old he was when he had Tom. He was close to 60. And for him to you know, survive in this country as a bachelor because of the Exclusion Acts, and all these things, and and finally go through this process to become a citizen. So he'd go back to the go back to China in the fifties, and then have Tom. That's why he would always look at Tom and smile. <laughs> He's probably saying, "How did this happen? How how could I have finally, you know, been able to raise a family?" And and it's kind of emblematic of what a lot of Chinese had to do during the Exclusion Act. The men would come in. There's this whole bachelor society, and uh, if they're lucky, they're able to go back and, and get married and start a family. So a lot of families I know have the um, wife came over after the 40s and often right after the war. And, and it's it's a, a story of like, the immigration laws, how they really affected all of our families in, in many ways. And so I think that that comes through in the film where you see Tom and, and like we have a person in our midst whose father was on the Titanic and you just think about it. So like, that's a hundred years ago. How did that happen? And, uh, you know, I really think Arthur and Stephen presented that really well, where he said, he's this normal guy who has a life in Milwaukee, has a family. And, and just to track a hundred years ago is, is just amazing. Uh, really a great experience to work on this film. I have a quick follow-up for you. Um, earlier you made this comment. Um, it seemed like Fang Long was hiding something, right? And, and we also have a question in the chat of, you know, did you ever figure out the matching or the connection between all his different names or the reason for name change? Um, and so, yeah, I'm just wondering, like, as a researcher, like, how do you kind of detect the patterns, the behavior, like, get in the head of this person that you're researching to be able to be like, oh, you know, like, we can start to kind of guess their motives. Um, we can start to try to figure out, like, why they did what they did. Yeah, during the exclusion era, of course, there were paper sons and everything. And so first I thought that might be why, but it seemed like he was just creative with use of his names. So I think the question about the, the Chinese is probably better answered by Stephen or Chloe or Arthur because they're bilingual. But I, uh, you know, maybe they can answer that. Sure. Um, and Stephen, did you want to also chime in as well to the previous discussion slash this question? <laughs> Ultimately, the the explanation for us. I mean, there's there's the scene in the in the in the documentary where, you know, it, it's always <laughs> working working with Chinese as a as a language, or I'll, I'll say a so called language in this case, because, you know, when we started off, we just didn't know: are we dealing with Toisan? Are we dealing with Cantonese? Are we dealing with Mandarin? What you know? Are we dealing with Hokkien? What what, you know, what are we dealing with? So, I think a lot of our viewers in China kind of watched the film and didn't quite get why certain people either didn't speak Chinese or didn't read Chinese or, you know, so there's that scene sort of at the beginning of the, of, uh, you know, when I meet Tom for the first time and we're looking at the films and, and we're looking at the photos and I say, oh, the names are different. And I, I think a few people were like, well, how come Tom never noticed that? And it's like, well, Tom doesn't read Chinese. So, you know, it's very, it's very, of course you wouldn't notice it, you know. Um, I mean, when we when we showed that name, so I only speak Mandarin, so I'll, I, I got to go with with what I know. But the um, the the shorter version of the name Feng Sen, when we showed that photo with that name to a couple of people who were Toisan speakers, they looked at it quickly and said Feng Long, and mistaking the the Sen character for for the shorter lean, I, I know I'm getting into like sort of the weeds of, of speaking Chinese now, but basically the two characters are similar, but if you look at them quickly, they, they can look the same. So, you know, I, I don't know whether they, you know, it was just sort of a, a, an iteration of his name, an incorrect iteration of his name that he went with. You know, we still don't really know that. We still don't really know where all of those names necessarily came from. Li Bing seemed to have used Li Bing throughout his life. So, you know, that seems to really have been his name or the name that he preferred. Um, you know, I think we, I mean, we certainly in the beginning, I think we spent two or two and a half years just agonizing over the names. Do we believe the names as, you know, as absolute 
fact and law and and therefore we have to we have to prove on those i think i think it was clo that really sort of you know set us straight like guys guys like don't worry about this you know people have you know when they're born they get one name when they when they you know later in life they get another name and then when they get married they get another name and you're dealing with people who in many cases were using identity papers it's another name you know so like don't don't oversweat the names um so so yeah i mean in the end it's that's that's sort of how we operated was that um i think cynthia says it well in in the film she says you know what what's in a name and what's what power does that give you when you change your name and on the one hand i think you might see it as it's a sad thing that a person has to change their name or that they have to take on another identity in order to to live the life that they want to live whether it's to gain entry to a country that they're trying to to go to or um you know because they're being hunted by immigration officials or but you know also when you give yourself an identity when you declare i am you know this person i i think there is a certain amount of empowerment there yeah, i was just going to add on the end of that um the um just a couple of sort of notes about how we try to reconstruct this story some as Stephen says, some of this stuff is sort of fairly in the weeds and you have to make a call. Bear in mind, you know, we're trying to make a story about the six. And so we did have more information on on on, 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 on some of which we sort of held back because it was just too hard to explain. On the, on the Just to go back to this uh, issue that I think for, it seems incredibly detailed, but I mean, this is something we talked about for months and months and months. I think that probably the longest ongoing conversation we had was about Fong Long and what had happened to that name. In the end, the A-file that... Um, that Grant got for us um, revealed, I think, three or four other names that we hadn't seen before, including another English name for Fong Long. I think it was uh, Frankie. Is that right? I think it was Frankie something. Yeah, something uh, totally I mean, different. <laughs> totally different. <laughs> uh, there was a Frankie something. And then it was funny because one of the days we were filming Henry, uh, Henry Chu, who's uh, Tom's sort of distant cousin, uh, who's, who's actually the person the youngest person to have heard this story, Tom, Tom's cousin had heard the story directly from, from Fong Wing Sun of the, the escape from Titanic. And at some point he referred to uh, Fong Wing Sun as Vincent. And I, I turned to him and said, I mean, I've known you for a couple of years, Henry. You never, what are you talking about, Vincent? He said, oh yeah, he called himself Vincent sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, really? Another name? Frankie, Vincent, Lim, and and uh, we we actually found some records. These are less less confirmed, but we found some records of of Fong Wing Sun uh, in the UK. Um, uh, and here's the funny thing: we didn't bring this up in the film. It's incredibly complicated. But here's the strange thing: though we call him Fong Long because that's the sort of Anglo uh, anglicized version of we assume a Chinese name. The strange thing is that as soon as Fong Long starts giving himself a Chinese name with the first time we see his signature, which is on board a Netta following Titanic, the, the ship that they boarded after, after the Carpathia landed in, um, in New York. The bizarre thing is that Fong Long next to the name Fong Long, which he continues to occasionally use, although it, it changes its spelling slightly, but Fong Long, he continues to use for a while. The name in Chinese next to that is a name which reads Bing Xing. The same Bing as, as Li Bing. And the Xing is, I, I think, like, like new. Um, so, so very, very strange. I, I maybe knew, maybe I, it may actually be Star. I can't remember the Xing, but anyway, the point is a completely different name. So he's got a Chinese sounding name in English, and then he's got an actual Chinese name that never turns up in English. So he's clearly, you know, rummaging through different names. And then on the issue of Paper Sons, also confusing because I didn't know much about Paper Sons, but I saw, I knew the sort of basic model of pa Paper Sons and how that might work. Of course, there were Paper Daughters too. Um, you know, one thing that gets forgotten sometimes, very, you know, there were, there were a lot less of them, but there were some. But also, was Fong Wing Sun a paper son? Well, not in the traditional sense, not in the sense of buying documents and then arriving as someone else. But it's very conceivable, given that he was opening uh, companies, uh, you know, he opened two or three restaurants, a laundry house and so on in, in Chicago, that he was a de facto paper son in the sense of buying identities locally in order to do those, uh, do those things. That makes complete sense. I mean, we, 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 we discovered fairly late on, I think we finally confirmed it with the A-file that, that essentially he was an undocumented immigrant for, mm -hmm. for the best part of 35 years. 
So these are very complicated issues. And sometimes people, you know, some people haven't even heard of the concept of paper sum, but even when you get that concept, are they exactly that model? You know, history is a bit messier than that. And family histories are often don't fit exactly the, the sort of model version of, of something that you've, you've heard of. So it was, it was deeply uh, complicated and <laughs> just another area of, of complexity that we had to kind of untease and find a way to it, to tell that story in, in the space of a film. I just wanted to add to that. Um, we got so deep in the names and to add what that was like in the UK UK context, the whole reason behind why the um, the Board of Shipping decided to create these amazing photo cards that you see in the film was because they realized even the, in the early 1900s, oh, we can't trust these Chinese seamen to tell us who they really are. We also don't know the difference from one to the next. Uh, we don't know what their real names are. So we need these cards to keep track of them. And as we saw from all the different uh, ships that the survivors worked on, they were very flexible with regards to how they wrote their names and how old they claimed they were or which alias they chose. Um, and there was this added uh, dimension, especially in the UK, where it was much easier for you to claim that you were from somewhere like Hong Kong or Singapore, uh, because then you wouldn't have to register as an alien uh, resident in the UK. So you had this added just lie after lie just to fit in. Um, that was so prevalent. Our people are so chameleonic um, and adaptable. I feel like, yeah, it's like a pro, but also a challenge in the research process. Uh, my, my last question before we open up the floor is, Stephen, you mentioned earlier about like empowerment. Um, there's a quote you say in the film where, you know, so many people feel like their family history is either not special or somehow shameful or just otherwise not important. Um, and I just remember in the festival uh, Q&A, um, you all had this discussion about how can this film be an opportunity and invitation for descendants, for Chinese descendants to reclaim their history with pride um, and not shame. Um, I know Grant, uh, the the story, the history of being a paper son, right, is part of your family history. I was wondering if you could speak a bit to your journey slash, or even what you've observed um, other other genealogists, right, um, go through in coming to terms with, uh, you know, these potentially shameful things uh, in your in your family's past, but like being able to reconcile with it and own it with with pride. Mm. There's a good quote that Judy Young and Erica Lee about. Um, a paper son. He said, we didn't want to uh, lie. We didn't want to violate the law, but the government made it difficult for us. So we had to take the crooked path to come to this country because of all of the exclusion laws. And so in many ways, that's, I think, how many of us pridefully talk about our, our families that came over as, as paper sons, because my grandfather had to say that he was the son of a man named Ao just to come to this country. And um, you look at all the records, like I was looking for his his file for many years and finally got it, but I knew whatever was in there was gonna be untrue because he had to take on this whole other identity to cover. And for my aunt, whose husband actually, I, I was a paper son, she wouldn't talk about anything in the past. She was born in the United States, yet that stigma of being married to someone who uh, even though he had died many years before, came over under uh, fraudulent papers was to her something that really affected her all of her life. And her son was never able to find out much about her, his dad and, and his mom that way. So I think when you're talking about, you know, owning the history, you know, I, um, it's nothing to be ashamed of at all. And it's something to be prideful of, I think, to see what our families overcame uh, years of basically institutional racism in, in this country, the laws of this country going way back to 1790 when the uh, founding fathers said you had to be white to become a naturalized citizen. So if as you learn this in context, you can say, wow, our answers was really amazing to come through the, the women who had to, uh, you know, say that they were like my, my grandmother came over as the wife of her brother-in-law because that's what his his papers let him bring over somebody. So all these things that people had to do, um, you know, make it something that we have to uh, own. And, um, you know, it's not something to be be ashamed of at all. Mm, so well said. 
Thanks for sharing, Grant. Um, sure. At this time, we um, are coming up on the hour, um, and I would love to open up the floor for everyone here who would love to ask a question, um, quote unquote, in person. Arthur and Stephen, I'm just wondering if you ever wondered why Henry was told so quickly, as almost as soon as he got here, about uh, Fongyun's son telling him about the Titanic when he never told his son. I mean, I I spend a lot of time wondering why Feng Wing Sun did things. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, exactly. You know, I I, uh, I won't pretend that I thought about them more than Tom has, but I certainly gave it a lot of thought, and I think it was probably just the occasion. You know, he was he was excited to have his new family members there, and just kind of served as an example to illustrate what he was, you know, trying to trying to say to Henry. You know, here's this young young boy that's just off the plane um, and about to start his life in the United States and has kind of, you know, when you look at Feng Wing Sun and, and his journey, how long it took him, you know, it took him, you know, 35 years to become a U.S. citizen. And here's Henry with 90 and, and uh, you know, he's, he's basically already on the path to citizenship and, uh, um, you know, just I think I think Henry probably just caught him at the right moment, and and it's almost like it, you almost wonder if you know if Tom had been paying attention, <laughs> and maybe he would have heard that conversation. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I mean, we've all been at we've all been at events where somebody said something and and other people didn't hear it, and it's never repeated, and that's just kind of the way it is. But yeah, it's it's I think probably Feng Wing Sun just was never able to. I think he really that. It, Tom always talked about that little notebook that his father carried, and I think the idea was that 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 notebook would would be there when he was no longer there, and that they would pick it up and finally read it. And this way, he wouldn't have to say it, and he wouldn't have to deal with 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 all of the emotion of telling those stories directly and seeing his 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 sons react and so forth. And you know, unfortunately, that that notebook does not seem to have survived. Mm -hmm. The thing I'd add to that is it is clear, I think, when you look back at those he did tell, I mean, it's just a little observation. It may just be random noise in the data kind of thing, but um, he only told people his Titanic story. And he, he often didn't use, you know, he we don't have a record of him saying specifically it was Titanic. It's the details that make it Titanic. Uh, but he only seems to have told people who were born in China. I guess my pet theory is, he felt like people who'd come across from China to the U S maybe, maybe would understand his story better. Mm. I think he was also my, another, again, just a theory, but, uh, but I heard this from other people. We heard this from people in the, the toy sign community in, in Manhattan when we spent an afternoon speaking to, to them, their parents, grandparents were often incredibly protective of them. So it's like, what you, what you don't know, you couldn't accidentally say in school or something. Um, so maybe, maybe that was a little to do with it as well. Maybe he was, maybe he felt like direct family, there's a risk that they could get into trouble. I, my, my feeling is that he never felt completely safe. I think even after 1955, when he naturalized and got his paperwork and everything, I, my sense is that you've got to think 35 years, sort of not on the run, but you know, with no paperwork, having to change identities, you've got to have a belief that, well, they may be saying that I'm safe now. And then there's an amnesty and we can come in, but who knows? I mean, that would make sense, wouldn't it? But I, I don't think, I'm not sure we'll ever know unless that notebook turns up. <laughs> but those, those are just some observations of, of some of the things that, you know, we, we saw as we went along with his story. I just love this round table. It's like we're just hanging out and speculating. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, is, this, is, this is how it was when we, when we made the film. I mean, if we'd had, <laughs> if we'd had this It was one, even it more fun that we could... Yeah, it was fun that we got to speculate all together. That certainly made it very exciting. Like what Grant was saying, yes. we'd report back whenever we found something. We're like, oh, I have no idea what this means. <laughs> Has yeah. anyone come across this? It was lots of fun, as yeah. well as incredibly frustrating at times. Yeah, and we had some things that were very kind of old school. You know, sometimes you think you can get all this stuff online, but, you know, we, we would apply for some... Um, you know, some archives from somewhere. And I'll, we, we'd get, I remember getting some Canadian archives from New, New, 
where were they from? England. I forget. Anyway, yes, that's the yeah, oh, that's those right. are the ones that saved all the crew lists from the UK. They said, "No, don't destroy them. We'll we'll take them." That's right. So they had all those crew lists, but then I remember that they couldn't. None of them uh, read any Chinese. So we had to sort of order. That's from memory. This is what happened. That we had to yes. kind of order a ton of stuff where we didn't know whether it was anything to do with our guys just because they, there was some Chinese writing on a piece of paper. Do you know what I mean? So we were, we were sort of waiting for these things to come in for weeks, and then they came in. And, you, you know, you just rifle through stacks of paper, and the vast majority have absolutely nothing to do with what we're okay. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all this excitement, then this big package arrives. Another one was a funny one I remember we had. We, we thought, because one of our things was, how do you confirm when the names are so inconsistent that a certain person is the person later who's claiming they were on? And one thought was that if you could find a photograph of someone on Titanic, one of the Chinese guys, and then you have a photograph of them later, well, that's clearly them. That would make sense. So we kept trying to look through photographs of, of Titanic, and in particular, the lifeboat photographs. And they are held, I, I think, at the National Archives, or maybe at the Greenwich uh, Maritime Museum in London. And um, we, 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 um, the, the versions online, you know, the closer you get, the more pixelated they are. So we thought, well, this is going to be, you know, we know what the originals are. We'll get them rescanned and we'll, we'll have a look at them. And they said they couldn't send those digital copies, uh, but they could print them out large. So we, we would have them. So uh, after uh, literally months later, I received what was sort of an A1 cardboard, you know, this is through the post to China, massive sort of poster size um, package. And I opened it up and uh, there were, you know, however many, I think 12, 13 uh, prints. And uh, each one was an A4 piece of paper. And the, the photograph of the lifeboat, which we, as I say, we'd seen online, um, was the size of like three postage stamps wide and looked like it was a bad photocopy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a, like a massive expanse of white. They printed it out on massive paper, but the actual print was like a bad photocopy in the middle of it and about two inches wide. So wow. we could, we, they were far worse than anything we could find online. They also cost us a lot of money. So there were things like that would turn up, you know, that were just, <laughs> you didn't know whether to laugh or cry. You wait for months and then nothing turns <laughs> up. And then the next day you get an email from a descendant and, and suddenly you're on a roll again. So it was, it was often like that. Yes. That or you come across two names of two survivors on the same document and you think, oh, my God, maybe <laughs> they were still together then. And then you realize, oh, wait, the dates don't match up. Oh, how disappointing. Yes, yes. I, <laughs> one, one question that I was wondering is like, because there, there's just so many things that you could have you could have talked about. Right. And of course, only so much can make it into a feature. Like if if you had the chance to do the six as like an episodic TV series or something, like go much deeper, what would you want to unpack further? Uh, I would. Say, I have I, two sort of. Oh, you go sorry. ahead. You go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there were several subplots that were quite quite interesting. Uh, one of them, at least in the UK. I believe at the time I was researching Alam, who is the older survivor, also known as Lam Choi. And I think it was Arthur or Stephen messaged me and said, oh, we found this Lam Choi in Liverpool. He seems to have married uh, a local English woman. Uh, maybe, maybe he had children and he stayed there. And so I spent some time trying to track down a descendant of, of this Lam Choi. And I found a lady living in Liverpool um, after a lot of time looking online. And she said, yes, Lam Choi was my, my grandmother's uh, husband. They, they divorced later, they didn't have any kids, but, uh, but he's buried here. And I got very excited. But unfortunately, after digging deeper, it turned out that he was uh, too young and born in a different place. But uh, I think Liverpool was quite an important focal point in the story. It was an even bigger Chinatown than London at, a time, at the time. Um, and a few of our survivors went through there. In fact, right at the end, when um, there was all this talk of potentially repatriating all of these unemployed Chinese people who were milling about Liverpool and, and Limehouse in London, 
They interviewed, the police, sorry, in Liverpool, interviewed over a thousand seamen to see whether they would be willing to leave um, voluntarily. And they interviewed the same Lam Choi, whose photo we have, who we believe was the survivor, was one of the survivors. Um, and they interviewed to ask him, would you be willing to leave? How much money do you owe the boarding houses? How long have you been here? And in this mini interview summary, he says, yeah, I've been unemployed for six months. Um, and, and the last boat that I worked on was this one. And I still owe my boarding house owner like nine pounds, which was um, several weeks worth of rent. Um, so th that whole sub story was was quite exciting. Obviously, it did not lead to anything, but um, that would be one story that was very enjoyable to work on. Um, another thing was, so during World War One, there were uh, thousands of Chinese who were working on civilian cargo ships. And it's believed that, uh, let me see if I have the number here somewhere. Um, but many thousands of them died because they were torpedoed by by German submarines. I mean, during both world wars, Germany had this policy where they just raged unrestricted warfare, even on merchant ships that were carrying food or transporting just injured soldiers. It, they they would they would um, yeah they would attack anything and anyone. Um, so there was a very real possibility that some of the survivors simply could have died at that time between 1914 and 1918. Um, and that would also have been a very true and heartbreaking story, but it was a reality. Um, yeah, I would say those two. <laughs> I was going to add another one. There, we, there was a storyline that we were, we were going to pursue, but we had to drop for budget reasons, um, which was that you'll have seen in the film, we realized, uh, well, Stephen realized, in fact, uh, that that uh, there was a good chance that one of the graves of the 300 or so bodies that were pulled out of the water uh, a few days after Titanic sank uh, and rescued about one, one fifth of the people who died there, their their bodies were were were, were found and, and brought back and mainly buried in in, in Halifax and Nova Scotia in, in Canada. Um, and for some reason, nobody had picked up before that there was one of the graves, uh, an unidentified grave. Uh, the body there had been described as looking like Japanese. And uh, of course, there were Japanese. There was one Japanese guy on board, but he, he survived. He was a second class passenger and survived. So there's a good chance that that grave is is one of the Chinese guys. And of course, we're in a different world now than we would have been in, say, 15 years ago. You know, with DNA testing, it's quite possible that we'd have been able to, um, if we'd have been able to, to find DNA and then used one of the, you know, the services that you can use it. It's possible you'd, you'd even find relatives of his. Um, it's possible. We don't, we don't know that for sure. But I mean, you go on that. I mean, it's not my, my mom had a, a DNA test on, I think, on Ancestry. And uh, since she's done it, you know, dozens of relatives have turned up over time. So you can, those are things you can leave there. And, and, and then over time, maybe over decades, you discover relatives and so on. And, and then you solve that mystery. Uh, in the end, the reason why we didn't do that was it was a very expensive process um, to do to, to find DNA. And also because the Titanic gravesite has been flooded many times. And I, I believe there's been a few attempts to extract DNA. I think one of them was successful. Uh, with the unknown child, um, but I think others have, have failed. So there's, it's quite possible we wouldn't have found anything, and the the amount of money it would have taken would have been, um, you know, pr pretty pretty large. And it turns out actually there is a sort of happy ending to this because there is in fact now a, a project going ahead to, I think, to look for DNA of all of the unknown bodies that were buried in that in that grave site. So there's this, you know, it's some so the so the grave that we were looking at in particular. Uh, at some point will will be tested, and uh, you know we can always we can always follow up on uh, on these things. Yeah, speaking of graves, um, we have a question from the audience of why was East London Cemetery not able to give the burial location of Changchip? Yeah, if it was an unmarked public grave, it'd be lovely to know where he rests. Yes, it, it would have been lovely indeed. It wasn't quite an unmarked public grave. I contacted the um, the people who manage the cemetery, and they said that uh, 
in 1980, they buried someone else on top of him. And so due to privacy reasons, they couldn't disclose this particular person's grave. In any case, we wouldn't have seen um, yeah, Chung Chip's headstone if he had one or anything like that. Um, but I think when, when we went there, the two days we went to visit it, we were pretty sure of the location because it, it was... Um, uh, all of the Chinese burials, at least the burials from that time, were in a line in that particular area. So he would have been in a sort of three meter kind of area where we're seen standing uh, at East London Cemetery. That was really uh, sad, actually. I mean, I think that's that sort mm -hmm. of it. Just says a lot that uh, you know that he's a guy that's for so. And it's his disappearance is sort of compounded by so many historical factors. Mm. That, that not only is he completely disenfranchised, um, you know, in his lifetime, and and uh, and and you know, discriminated against, and 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 not well looked after, and 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 you know, poorly sick, even even on Aneta, and then dies still a very young man. But then his grave itself has no one to to care for it. That he was sort of, you know, buried, and then and utterly forgotten and then at a certain point they just sort of sell his grave on and then at the point even when we come along and look for it because that's happened in a way there's now a legal reason why we can't even know where his grave was i just find very you know terribly terribly sad that that's that's the way it is and and it was compounded even more actually because well first of all to say that the east london cemetery being east london is filled with mainly working class and immigrant people and uh, I mean, it's a very different thing from some of the wealthier cemeteries in the middle of London or in the western parts of London mm -hmm. and so on. So, you know, you look at it in, in some ways, it's a kind of joy. You know, there's lots of color in it and there's still people putting flowers out and things. It's a very sort of diverse, you know, lots of different designs. There's nothing. It's very ramshackle. It's kind of thrown together. But you can you can you know, it has a lot of immigrant names there and all, and all the rest of it. But, you know, sadly, given that that's the case. We were, we, um, I mean, Chloe will remember this as well. We tried to go in and film that. You know, the, I actually tried to film once and we were roundly told that we couldn't film in there. So you get, you sort of think, well, this is ridiculous. I know they're not specifically stopping us from doing this. It's a sort of regulation, you know, but when the regulation is stopping us from telling a story, it's particularly depressing as a, as a documentary maker that, that a regulation is clearly about privacy laws and so on. But because of that, we can't go in and tell a story. So we ended up having our, our, our editor in London, John Mister, went in with, with Chloe and we filmed it on a, a mobile phone. I mean, it's, it's just bear in mind, this is not a sort of law that you would go to jail. It's just a, it's just a bylaw or something where they, they, they just decide, you know, that the, the council doesn't want you to film in certain places and so on. But it, it's particularly depressing because you can go into some of the much wealthier cemeteries. And I filmed in, Stephen and I filmed in lots of cemeteries, but uh, because of what we've done film-wise. But, you know, that was the one, I remember most clearly that we were sort of rudely told that we couldn't go in with even at the small camera that I had. So it just uh, that sense of like, wow, this is incredible. Even in the telling of the story, we're being hindered. That feeling of frustration that you're describing, I definitely feel like a lot of us here are no strangers to it. Um, we often talk about the brick walls, right? <laughs> and the breakthroughs. But the reality is most of the time, it's a lot of brick walls um, that we're just kind of stuck at, um, wondering, you know, have we hit a dead end? Do we just need to wait for the, the universe or, you know, something else to fall into alignment um, before we can move forward? Um, and so I, I love the question that Grant brought up in the chat. Um, what, what kind of advice do any of you, do all of you have for those of us here across many different generations and across the diaspora? Um, that are trying to research and be that family historian for their family, for the next generation, whether it's, you know, starting here or trying to go back to the village. I'll start off. I mean, something that I've said, you know, at other talks about this, and I think it's, we've touched on it a little bit, but I think it is, you know, on the one hand, we live in a digital age and probably every search that we start, you know, that, that, that we initiate either begins with Google or, you know, maybe moved on to DuckDuckGo or, you know, whatever your, your favorite search engine is. But I think that's a great starting point. It saves a lot of money and time. But I think ultimately you have to go and get the original documents. You know, don't, don't traffic in rumor. Don't, don't traffic in legend and myth. 
if you're if you're working on this kind of material, you know, you've you've got to go get the fact what what does the evidence say? And the actual documents tell you a lot. You know, it's not a it's not an earth shattering discovery, but but seeing the original doc you know, the original passenger list and looking at the name, you know, Alam and seeing that it's Alam so many times, you know, there are things that the documents itself, I'm not talking about the information that's on the document. I'm talking about the piece of paper itself, you know, things that it tells you, um, notes in the margin that don't always make it into a scan, um, you know, a person's signature, their handwriting. Um, there are all kinds of things. And, and the other thing is that is as close to that person as you are ever going to get, especially if you're you know, working on stuff that's a, a century old or, or, you know, sort of the time period that we're working in, you're never going to get to meet the person and you may never get to meet their, you know, even their, their children, if they had any, go have that contact with the documents and, and really with that person. I think that's critically important. You know, as Arthur was describing, yeah, sometimes you get the, you, you know, you get the photo and it's like a postage stamp, but, but, you know, that process is so important, you know, learn how to, work in archives, learn how to work in libraries. Um, you know, the, the reality is, is that we've only been digitizing history for the last 20 years or so. The, the good thing is that especially for 18th century, 19th century, there are lots and lots of records, at least in sort of the, in the United States, Canada, the UK, uh, Europe, <laughs> but also in, you know, in China as well, Hong Kong as well. Um, go get the documents, go pull the file, Look at its condition, like Close said, you know, look at the way that the documents have been treated. Um, you know, that that is really important. Um, it tells you a lot of the story that you won't get just from, you know, looking at some some uh, some things on, on Google. It's really important that you look at the originals as much as possible. I would add to that the villages um, in, in Toy. I mean, go to the location as well. Because, um, I mean, you, there's a scene in the film, which still, you know, still really, I, I still think about that a lot. Uh, when we were walking around in, in one of the villages, and in fact, this happened many times. And, you know, somebody walks up and says something, oh, are you guys doing this story? Or, oh, are you interested in that? Or you, you ask a, an, an old lady about something, you know, were there survivors of shipwrecks from this village? Or... Um, I mean, the extraordinary time when we went into, you may remember, uh, if you've seen the film, we walked into a guy's house following David Lee, one of our uh, researchers who, whose family is from Toy San, and um, he has no top on. I think he has a pair of shorts on, and he's got a fan blasting away in the background that we didn't turn off. We just left it on because it was so hot. And we just started talking about Titanic, and he's like, oh, Titanic, is that is that, that American, that you know, that foreign ship that went down? And then he starts to have some memory of it. And then he talks about it. And then an uncle walks in and he says, oh, yeah, we were, we talked about that when I was a kid. The adults all told us that there was a one of our just, you know, ancestors was on Titanic. And it's like, this is unbelievable. You know, you walk in the house and, and, and people are so open about these things often because they, you know, people, uh, these things get stored up and you, you don't ask someone. They never bother to tell you or there's reasons why they don't tell you. But if you do it. And so I, there's a very practical thing I'd say. I always do this. I think I, I, I can't emphasize it enough. You know, when you walk into a village like that, you know, try and just be, or, or anywhere, you know, anywhere new where there's a chance you might meet people who know things. You know, I, I, I always think that we underestimate the, the, the human side of, of these things. You know, there are, there are stories hidden away with people and your attitude when you walk in is incredibly important. And people will often say to, to us, you know, is it difficult to film in China? And there are obviously some things that make it more difficult than other places and everywhere has its own complexities. But nothing beats a, an open mind and a smile when you walk in and a kind of an openness to the experience and a kind of a, a willingness to listen and, and to be present in the moment and not always to just look for the thing that you thought you went in there for. Because sometimes there's something else you'll find when you're there. And that's an attitude thing. That's not a data thing, but it just, it's, it's worked so well for us in the past. How did you find uh, Fong Wing Sun's village again? Was it through David or? or... Uh, well, the, the, we were on one particular island, the Shatrandal, the, you know, the, 
there's two there's two islands, the Trandao Islands, and and um, the the one where we find found the most information was Shatrangao, which is off the coast of Taisha. It's still part of that uh, county. Um, but um, what happened is that I did an initial research trip back in about 2016, I think, with my assistant at the time, Emily. Both of I mean, Emily is from Shanghai. Both of us, you know, Mandarin and English speakers. Neither of us with either Cantonese or Toisan Toisanese, and um, and we uh, we went there and we stayed. We had no idea really what we were looking for. We sort of had an idea that uh, Fong Wing San had been born somewhere in the middle of the island, and we a very curious thing happened. So we were st we stayed in a hotel that that first night, and um, in the morning we went downstairs and we said we want to get a taxi but we don't really know where we're going we kind of know a couple of things about it that tom and his wife had told us um and um, we picked up from the pile of business cards for taxis we picked up the top one emily called him he arrived 15 minutes later we got in and we said we're kind of looking for this place and he said oh you mean the fong village <laughs> and we said oh the fong village he said yeah i know them I, my name's fong as well so i actually i'm from there originally and we were like this is ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> the number of times that happened wow. was, was it was like somebody was working in a you know and he knew them he actually knew the nephew fong shaoying who is the guy that remembers the poem i mean he knew him personally knew him so we, we <laughs> that that's how we found the fong village the taxi driver had the same surname and knew the guy that we were going there to find, even though we didn't know the guy we we're going to find. We didn't we didn't know he existed at that point. We just knew there was a family in a village that sort of looked like this and was somewhere in the middle of the island. So we were incredibly lucky. Okay, the truth of that area is that um, many of the villages, not all, but many of the villages are are, are single family name villages. So that this is the this is the Lee village, and this is the you know the Fong village, and this is the you know the Chen village and the Wang village, and so on. And sometimes there might be a couple of villages that have the same family name. And of course, they're not exclusively one name, but they, they have this long history. And um, so they're the best place to start. You know, you know a family name, you go to that village. If it's not them, they'll be like, oh, it's the other Fung village. And then they'll tell you where it is. And they'll often give you a name. And then you go there and you speak to them. And then they call the village, uh, you know, it's one of the government people or a, a local party secretary or something. And then they call someone else. And, and you just being there on the ground, you, you pick up so much. You know, so so much information doing it that way, but that's how that's how we found the Fong Village. We found it in about half an hour because our taxi driver had the same family name. That's amazing. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> wow. Um, Chloe or Grant, did you want to share any advice or tips or final words of wisdom? Go ahead, Chloe. I completely agree with everything that Arthur said. There's something very powerful about pilgrimages in general. And even if you don't discover what it is that you set out or you don't answer the questions that you had posed yourself, you will always come back with something. And it's not something that you can really do long distance. Um, and this applies to your village as well as to, uh, I don't know, a, a family temple that could be in California or anything like that. Yeah, I was lucky to go back to uh, my Aoyang village, uh, my mom's side, and my Gong village on my dad's side. And the Aoyang village was with a, a group of fifth and seventh cousins I met uh, through the internet, through someone who had posted he's looking for Aoyangs. <laughs> and so this was in the early days of the internet, and uh, it was like a message board, and a cousin had come across it. And just to be there was amazing. I actually met my step-grandmother who had married my grandfather, when he was 68 and she was 24, uh, so she was still alive um, in 20, uh, 2006 when I went back. And so that was pretty amazing. It was kind of bittersweet because they were saying, you know, he never brought her back because he couldn't. Um, I don't know what he was thinking when he got married, um, that maybe he thought he'd be able to bring her, her to the US, but because he wasn't a citizen, and didn't serve in the army and all these things, he could never bring her back. So they kind of um, uh, had saved up all these uh, things they wanted to tell me <laughs> as a representative of the family. And it was, uh, but they said, well, after, you know, after a while that, that the family's done better and I got to meet her daughter and her um, uh, grandkids who are my half, half first cousins. So um, it was half, half, first cousins yeah first cousins so it was it was just indescribable so i, I recommend folks do that if they can 
feel like that captures so well the full circleness of how you know the process bridges right those who are left behind those who left those who've stayed um right. those who've you know, meeting in, in the middle to share all the stories uh, or like tell a fuller story as we were talking about earlier. Um, I'm kind of curious how, how, what have been the responses uh, between like the overseas diaspora versus like Chinese and mainland? Like, have there been any I don't know, interesting nuances or, or similarities since the film has come out? <laughs> Your audiences are just, uh, I, I feel like people just become <laughs> humans you know they <laughs> when they sit in the cinema and watch a film it's uh it's a strangely uh solo activity uh, and yet you're surrounded by other people so i'm always loath to kind of separate audiences out and say you know chinese audiences like this or or other audiences like that i get i get asked a lot about it i get asked a lot about it in china as well about you know will will american audiences like this film or will british audiences like this film or something in terms of the diaspora, the, you know, we've had such an incredible reception uh, from uh, the, the, the Chinese community worldwide and people who are connected to it or married into it and all, or all the rest of it. I mean, it, they, 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 people have been so incredibly supportive from the moment we started filming this. I mean, Stephen and I and the rest of the crew spent several days walking around Chinatown in Chicago and just in and out of people's houses. And, you know, there were cups of tea served and we didn't have a single person, you know, do what they did in the East London cemetery and say, you can't film here. I mean, it was just that the doors were open to us and everyone was so, you know, we were undeserved welcoming we got as we went around. And, and the same has been true since we played the film. I mean, uh, I'm sure I speak for both of us when I say, you know, we partly just feel incredibly lucky that this story sort of landed on our plate when it did. And the timing has been been so great. And we've had so many people uh, just offer unconditional support to the to the whole thing that we can't really thank the diaspora enough for both the help in making the film and, and, and the reception it's got. Mm. And on that note, I guess this is a, a good note to bring things home on. Of, are there any updates on how everyone may be able to watch the film um, with their families uh, going forward? And more broadly, how can we support the film? How can we continue to support the film? Uh, well, we are sort of, you know, we're rolling out in multiple countries. So um, we we had the China run in, in cinemas back in April, May. Uh, and now in China, it's on the big platforms here, Aichi and Yoku and, and others. So everyone in China can now see it. Um, we played on the um, the ABC, the big the big channel in, in, um, in Australia. We played in Spain and Japan. Um, we're about to play in Hong Kong, I think. That's just about to come up. Of course, the big question are the countries that feature outside of China in the film, the US, Canada, and the UK, but then, you know, bro broadly everywhere else as well. And we we have a, you know, an, a distributor, an agent who's taking the film out to those places. In terms of helping us, we, we, have, um, we have little mini flurries of theatrical runs. So in the States, we've had, uh, uh, you know, a lot of great uh, festivals have been playing the, 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 playing the film and it's had a great reception and, and won some awards and so on. Audience reaction has been really good. We'd love to get it on a broadcaster. We know this, I can't say who, but there is interest in broadcasting it. So we're, we're, that hopefully should happen soon. But you know, the best way to help us is to get online and talk about the film and write a review on IMDb or write to Rotten Tomatoes or uh, what's it called, Letterboxd. You know, the more we have people giving us good reviews, and and saying and talking about the film and sharing it and say, you know the, the the better for us. So at the moment, that's the process we're in. We're just trying to get it out to as many broadcasters as we as we can and play in theaters. We're about to open in about two weeks' time in the UK and uh, a theatrical run. So there's going to be a the Picture House chain, which is a, a large um, independent chain, is going to play in I think about ten cities in uh, November and December. And again, there we'll do the same thing. So hopefully, we open, we get some good reviews. And uh, from audiences and, and and professional reviewers, and then uh, and then it starts to uh, and if the reception is good and people support it and go out and watch it, then um, hopefully we go, you know, onto 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 a longer theatrical run or onto TV. Um, but keep an eye out for what we're doing. We have a, a Facebook page which has been a huge support to us all the way through the project, 
with uh, you know thousands and thousands of followers there. At uh, if you search for the Six Documentary on Facebook, if you're not there um, already, and and it's on Twitter if you search for for the same thing. And uh, there is a there is a website, the Six Documentary dot com. So all the releases uh, worldwide we announce across the platforms as soon as we know them. So you know if you know the film's going to play in a certain place, let relatives and friends know because the more cinemas fill out and the bigger viewership for TV, the more likely it, it just runs and runs. DVD, people always ask about DVDs. Of course, we're, you know, living in China, DVDs have really disappeared here. <laughs> the format has moved on now. Um, so we don't see them around as much. Well, I've got a stack in front of me right now in my living room. Um, but um, uh, DVDs will, it will be on DVD at, uh, at some point, but uh, it, it goes out on the, on the sort of the online platforms uh usually before that so dvds will be some way down the road but it's definitely going to happen at some point uh, i know grant you had a further question about oh i was just wondering how if you have uh, audience numbers from uh the immigration or friday harbor film festivals it seems like a lot of people i know saw it so i'm happy to say and also are you planning any th theatrical run here in the bay area <laughs> or chicago milwaukee where uh tom's um, the Bay Area, I'm not sure, but we, we have film festivals coming up. So uh, at the moment, the U.S. approaches film festivals until we go to a, a broadcaster. Um, there's a chance it may get picked up for a theatrical uh, run. We'll see and we'll, we'll announce that. Um, I think there is a screening. Chicago is really important to us and we haven't played there yet because it's so close to, you know, the, the Wisconsin base that Tom and his family and others are in. And Chicago Chinatown was such a part of Fong Wilson's life that we'd love to take it there. I mean, I've always dreamed that somehow we would take the film theatrically at least close to Chinatowns. I think that would be a great sort of base for it to, to, to start and then hopefully spread out from there. Um, so I'd love to do that. You know, you, you need to get a, a theatrical um, distributor to sign on to that. But we have had interest. It's uh, amazing. You know, for documentary makers, we get used to playing on, you know, channel number three on regional broadcasters, but, uh, for it, you know, <laughs> uh, but so the chance to play on big broadcasters like uh, the ABC in Australia and, and we're talking to big broadcasters in the U S and, uh, and so on. And then to play on the big screen is kind of ex extraordinary, but you know, we'll, um, my man lie, as we say in China, it's gonna, it, it'll, it'll gradually happen. Hopefully by the end, we'll have reached pretty much, uh, pretty much everywhere. Mm. Yes. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> yes. Thank you all so much for your time and your wisdom. Um, yeah, just sharing more of the process with us. I've learned a lot and I hope that, yeah, the rest of you are coming away with something. Just wanna say thank you, applause, um, send your love in the chat uh, for our panelists here today. Thanks so much for joining. Um, and be sure if you're not already, uh, follow The Six on Facebook and we can pop a link to that to stay updated for the future. Um, our community as well, my China Roots server on Discord, you're, you're in, you're into our space. So yeah, if there's anything we do in the future, future events, you know, doing research together, if there's anything that you need help with, um, whether it's translating a document or just processing, you know, how do I talk to a relative, right? Um, we have channels dedicated to each of those topics here in our space. So you're welcome to come plug in. We'd love to get to know you and where you are in your research journey. Um, and I know a lot of us love to <laughs> stay after, uh, hang out, um, have a bit of a after party chat. And so uh, I'm going to be closing this stage channel. But if you scroll all the way down, um, you'll see there's voice channels for Story Corner, for Research Lab. Hop on over to those channels to continue the conversation. But for now, I know it's getting late pushing on i think what 1 a.m for you arthur in china um so that's right that's right <laughs> yes but i want uh, just before we go i wanted to say sure. thank you as well chris Lim, for organizing this it's been a really great experience and uh i really admire this uh, setup here that you guys have got and i also wanted to say just more generally thanks to my china roots for the huge support we've had with there's a whole section of the film that we did in in beijing and the beijing team with Wei Han and and huge mm -hmm. chris Lin up there and other your colleagues there uh, were incredibly helpful to us and gave us some great leads um, and and so on. So so thanks thanks for doing that. What well, you're doing a really important work that I think is uh, you know it was at the heart of our story as well. Mm. <laughs> yes, mm. absolutely. I mean, we we couldn't have done it without you. So thank you. <laughs> High fives all around. <laughs> Go team. <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pleasure working together. Yeah.
It was wonderful. Stephen, Arthur, Grant, um, now that you are on Discord, like feel free to use this space too. Um, if there's anything <laughs> that you know, you're know you cooking up or resources you like to share, whatever, um, just a very- I'm gonna, be on here. I'm gonna be on here every day from now on. You, you won't get to get rid of me. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Cool. All right, have, a, have a wonderful rest of your day slash good evening um, to everyone. Um, I'm going to close the stage channel now, but thank you again. And we will see you next time. All right. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Kristen. Bye. Bye-bye.